Did you know that? When Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus, he expected the, the children and the teenagers in that church to listen to what he has to say here, and he, he's actually writing specifically to the kids. And that's, you know why that is? It's because God loves you, and God cares about you, and God wants to, to speak to you, kids. And so, kids, let me just say two things to you quickly this morning before you go to Children's Church. First of all, I, wanna, I want all the kids to know that God has put your parents in your life, and he's given them a really important job. That job is to raise you, and to teach you about Jesus, and to teach you how to live for Jesus. That means that you need to listen to your parents, and to obey them, and to respect them. Your parents aren't perfect, they're going to make mistakes, but they love you, and Jesus wants you to obey your mom and dad so that you can learn to obey him. The second thing that I want to say to you kids is that when you do that, you know what's going to happen? Life is going to go well for you. The Bible says here in Ephesians 6 that when you obey and honor your parents, life is going to go well, and even that you're going to have a long life. God wants you to enjoy those blessings of life going well and having a long life. He wants, you to, he wants to fill your life with his joy. And so, you can, kids, you can look at the picture that's going to go up on the screen here behind me. We call this the, the circle of blessing. If you notice, there's, there's a person in the circle there, and it says obey and honor above and below that person, and then go well and, and long life. When you obey and honor your parents, the Bible says, it will go well with you, and you'll have a, a long life. And you want to be in that circle. That's kind of where you want to live your life. When you disobey your parents, or you treat them with disrespect, it's like you're leaving the circle. And life doesn't go well out there when you leave the circle. If you stay out there, and you keep dishonoring your parents, there's going to be consequences in your life, and, and those consequences are not fun. And so, when you disobey, your parents are going to correct you, and they're going to discipline you, not because they enjoy doing that, but because they love you, and they want you to get back into that circle of blessing. Parents, if you want, you can write that circle down and take a picture of it with your phone. Um, it's from Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp, and I think it's a, a really useful illustration um, that you can use, your, use to remind your kids that life goes best for them when they're obeying and honoring you. And so, kids, that's what I wanted to tell all of you this morning. God loves you, and your parents love you, and God wants you to listen to your mom and dad so that you can learn from them how to follow Jesus. So, with that said now, the kids that are three years old in kindergarten, as well as the kids that are in first through third grade, and any other kids that are in the Christmas program, can go back now for Children's Church. All the kids that are in the Sunday School Christmas program are going to be going back to Children's Church uh, during the sermon, so that's something that parents can just be uh, aware of. Let me read now Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, this is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as we continue studying through the book of Ephesians, we're, we're thankful that you have a passage for us in this great book that has to do with children, that has to do with parenting, that has to do with how we raise our kids. <laughs> Lord, thank you that you even have a few verses here that are written specifically to children because you love them and because you care about them. And so, Father, I pray that you would use this time now to, to feed us and to build us up and to help us to learn what you're word has to teach us about raising our children. Lord, our, our kids are such an incredibly precious gift that you've entrusted to us, and we want to be good stewards of that gift. Lord, we want to raise our children, and most of all, see them grow up to walk with you, and to love you with all their hearts. And so, Lord, would you teach us now? Would you speak to us? And we pray, Father, for every child in this church, every teenager as well, even every infant that's still in the womb, Lord, that each child in this church will grow up to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and follow Him faithfully and live for His glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible is very, very clear about the fact that God cares very deeply about children. If you have children in your home, then you need to know that God loves your kids, He cares about their lives, He cares about their faith, 
And your children are incredibly important to God. And one of the things that God has done to show His love for your kids is that He's placed you in their lives to raise them. All us who are parents know that we have a responsibility to care for the needs of our kids, to provide food for them, to give them clothing and, and shelter, and to make sure that they get, get an education and so forth. But God has not only placed you in your kids' lives to meet those needs, He has also called you to be an instrument of His grace in the lives of your kids. Think about, it, think about newborn babies. Think about maybe your own children when they were newborns. They obviously need the parents to, to nurture them, to care for their needs. And those newborn babies also know absolutely nothing about God's way of salvation. They know nothing about Jesus. Their hearts, as the Bible tells us, are sinful right from the beginning. And of course they prove that over and over again in those early years, every time they have a temper tantrum. These are little human beings who desperately need Jesus. They are born desperately needing Jesus. And God has placed someone in their lives to help them to know Jesus, and to believe in Jesus, and to follow Jesus. And that person is you, Mom, or you, Dad. And so this is a weight of responsibility that we have. Parenthood is a calling. It's a calling to make disciples of the children that God has entrusted to us. And it's also really a wonderful opportunity, isn't it? <laughs> Every father and mother here loves their kids, and you want the best for them. And God has given you the opportunity to do the most important thing, the most loving thing that you could ever do for them, and that is to show Christ to them and to point them to Jesus. And so what is Paul going to teach us here about raising children? What does, what does God want to do in the lives of your kids? That's what we're going to think about this morning here in Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have children in your home right now, this passage is still relevant to you. I think all of us have children in our lives that we can impact for Christ. Whether they're your own children who are grown up now, or your grandchildren, or your nieces and nephews, or, or children in our church family, God can use you to minister to the kids in your life. And besides that, the fact is that all of us here are children. <laughs> that is, we all have parents. Unless your name is Adam or Eve, you have parents. And we're called to, to honor them. And we need to think about what that means for us, whether you're 5 years old or whether you're 55 years old. And so, Paul begins, again, by speaking directly to the kids in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, I want you to notice here, he does not just say, children, obey your parents. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, why is that important? Why is this phrase, in the Lord, so important? Well, I think it's important for at least two reasons. First of all, it points to the fact that God has placed parents in the family to, re to represent him, to represent his authority. Almost every society in the world believes that children should obey their parents. This is just common sense. But why should children obey their parents? What's the reason for that? Well, many people would say, well, this is just natural. Parents give life to their children, they raise them, they care for them, and so it's only right that children should obey. And besides that, children don't know how to behave. And parents do, at least hopefully they, they know how to behave, and so children should listen to their parents and, and learn how to behave from them. Now, of course, all of that is true, but those things are not the main reason why children should obey their parents. The main reason is that God has placed parents in the lives of their children as His representatives to teach them, to train them, even correct them and, and discipline them. Jesus of Nazareth is not literally going to show up at your door, knock on the door and come in and start teaching your kids. <laughs> but you know what? He doesn't have to. Because he's given that job to you. And he's entrusted you with his authority. And so, you can imagine in your mind a hierarchy with God at the top, and then parents underneath God, and then children underneath the parents. If the children are going to obey God, then they need to obey their parents. If the children disobey their parents, then really they're disobeying God. And so that leads us to the second thing that I want to point out about this phrase, in the Lord. And that is that if our children are going to truly live as Christian children, as followers of Jesus, then they need to obey their parents. 
You remember back in the Gospels where when Jesus said, let the children come to me? Remember the parents were bringing their kids to Jesus so that he could lay his hands on them and, and pray for them and bless them? And the disciples said, no, stop doing that. Jesus doesn't have any time for, for your kids. And Jesus rebuked the disciples because he loves children. And he says, let the children come to me. Now just imagine if one of those kids were to say to him, Jesus, I want to be your disciple. How can I follow you, Lord Jesus? What do you think he would have said to that child? I think he probably would have said several things, but I think that at least one of the things he would have said is, if you want to be my disciple, you know what you need to do? You need to obey your mom and dad. One of the most important things you can do to learn to follow me at this stage of your life, little boy or little girl or, or big boy or girl, <laughs> is to obey your parents, to honor them. Because if they love me, they're going to teach you how to follow me. And so... <clears throat> Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. The Lord Jesus is pleased. He is happy when children obey their fathers and mothers. And so if we want our kids to learn to follow Jesus as his disciples, and to really live a Christian life as children, then it's crucial that we teach them to obey us. Now, of course, this does not mean that we can treat our kids like slaves and justify it by saying, well, Jesus said you have to obey me. Well, that, that's not what this means. But at the same time, if we allow our kids to live in disobedience and then there are never any consequences for that, then we're teaching them, you don't need to obey me and you don't need to obey God. It doesn't really matter whether or not you follow Jesus. And so we need to teach our kids the importance of obedience. Not so that we can be controlling, not so that we can boss them around, but for their sake. So that they can learn to, so that as they learn to obey us, they can learn to obey Jesus. Now, in the next two verses, Paul has a command for children. And that command is paired with a promise. Really a, a wonderful promise. Paul is quoting the Ten Commandments here. He's quoting the Fifth Commandment from Exodus chapter 20. In verses 2 and 3, he writes, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. So let's start with the command. What does it mean to honor your father and mother? Well, honoring your parents begins in the heart. It begins with an attitude of respect, even an attitude of reverence, we could say. Leviticus 19.3 says, Every one of you shall revere his father, excuse me, his mother and his father. In the 21st century, we've gotten really far away from that, haven't we? How many children today do you see revering their parents? And yet, because God has given parents that place in the family where they represent Him, He expects children to not be disrespectful towards their parents, but to love them, to appreciate them, and to have a, a, a serious respect and honor for their parents. Now, of course, as parents, we can't force our children to honor us, you know, we can't just yell at them and say, you need to, you need to respect me. <laughs> That's not going to change their hearts or help them to honor them, to help them to honor us in their hearts. But what we need to do is to pour into our relationship with them. We need to win the hearts of our children by loving them well. Proverbs 23, 26 says, my son, give me your heart. And that's the attitude that we need to have towards our children. We need to win their hearts in the way that we spend time with them build into their lives, and pour into our relationships with them. Then they'll learn to honor us and respect us because they know how we be. We love them and care for them. And when parents, and when children honor their parents and their hearts, and that honor is worked out in day-to-day -day obedience, God has promised for them, verse 3, that life will go well for them and that they'll enjoy a long life. Now, I just want to say that that certainly does not mean that every child who honors their parents is going to have a perfect life. We'll have a life free from difficulty and where nothing goes wrong. Obviously, there are children who, who honor their parents. And there are children and who, and who don't have everything go well for them in their lives. There are children who honor their parents and their lives are yet are, are cut short. But that's the exception to the rule. In general, Paul is saying, for those kids who honor their parents, God is going to bless them with a long life. And so think about children on the flip side, who are never taught to honor their parents. Kids who live a, a wild life from the beginning. You often see that life does not go well for them. 
They face a lot of hardship that they bring upon themselves. Sometimes their lifespans are cut short because of wrong choices that they've made, things like, things like getting into substance abuse or other risky behaviors. <coughs> but when kids learn to honor their parents, in general, Paul is saying, life will go well because they'll be making wise choices and they'll begin to have a relationship with Jesus that's going to be lifelong. Yes, they'll face hard times. Yes, they'll face challenges. But even then, they have the blessing of knowing that Jesus is with them and the blessing of walking with Jesus through their trials. And really, what does it mean for it to go well with their children? It means, most of all, that they're living in fellowship with Jesus. And so moms and dads, this should be our goal for our kids. Our goal should be to train our kids to honor and obey us so that they'll learn to honor and obey Jesus and walk closely with Jesus throughout their lives. Really, if our kids are not the best at their sports, they don't get the greatest grades, if they don't grow up to have the most successful career, but they love Jesus with all their hearts, what more can we ask for as parents? And so moms and dads, let me ask you this morning, what's your goal for your kids? Do your goals for your children line up with God's goals for them? Are you pursuing what's best for your kids for eternity? That's the question we should all be thinking about. Now, before we go any further, I want to point out that this command to honor your father and mother applies not only to children that are growing up, it applies to every single one of us here. Every one of us, of course, has a father and a mother, and a mother. we're called to honor them. Even if your parents have passed away, you can still honor the memory of them in significant ways. And so for all of us here who have one or two parents that are, that are still alive, we need to ask ourselves the question, how can I honor my father and mother? Let me just give you a few suggestions. First of all, you can build into your relationship with your parents. I think it can be easy for us as adults really to neglect our relationships with our parents, to not think about our parents very often. But if we respect our parents and we have a, a rightful reverence towards them in our hearts, we're going to see that our relationships with our fathers and mothers are very important. They're important to God and they should be important to us. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that you need to, that you need to go and visit your parents every single day. But, if you only call and talk to your parents once every few months, this might be something that you need to work on. I think the principle here for us is is what Jesus articulated in Matthew 7, 12, in the Golden Rule. Do to others what you would have them do to you. When your children are adults, or if they already are adults, you probably don't want them to only give you a phone call on Thanksgiving and Christmas, and not talk to you the rest of the year. <clears throat> it's not that you're going to talk to your adult children every single day, but you probably want to have a significant relationship with them, whatever that looks like in your family. And so if that's how you want your kids, your grown children, to treat you, then shouldn't you do the same for your parents? And then as you build into that relationship with your, with your parents, you can think about how you can honor them in practical ways. How can you serve your parents? Maybe it's by raking their leaves at this time of year. Maybe it's by doing other things around the house that are getting harder for them to do as they grow older. What about giving your parents time with their grandchildren? Again, when your own children are grown, you're going to want to spend time with your grandkids, aren't you? And so shouldn't you do the same for your own parents and allow them to have time with their grandchildren? I think that one way that we can care for our parents as they age is by helping to care for them. Of course, this is going to look different for every family. For some, it will involve having your mom or dad move in with you. For others, it might involve helping them to move into a place where they can get more professional care. The important thing for ourselves is to ask, what can I do to, to really help them. What do they really need? How can I honor them and, and love them and do what's best for them? And then what does that look like as far as their care as they age? And so now that Paul, now, now that we've covered what Paul has to say to children, let's look at what he has to say to all of us that are parents. Verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I love that this is just very straightforward. It's very simple. Not that it's easy to do, but it's, it's not complex. It's just straightforward. Here's one thing to not do, and here's one thing that you should do. First of all, for all of us that are parents, or who will one day be parents, we should not provoke our children to anger. 
Now the fact is, of course, that all of our children will get angry at times because of the sin in their hearts, and we can't avoid that. But we need to do our best not to provoke them to anger by the way that we treat them. And so we need to ask the question, how do parents provoke their children to anger? What do we need to avoid doing so that we, so that we don't provoke our kids to anger? I think that one way that parents can do this is by neglecting their children. If you neglect your kids and don't spend much time with them, they're going to start to think that you care more about your work or your hobby or your friends or having fun or whatever it is more than you care about them. And at first you might not see it, but over time your kids begin to become resentful and that resent develops into bitterness and that bitterness develops into anger. And eventually you end up with teenagers that are angry with you because you haven't spent much time with them at all over the last decade. And so we need to avoid uh, provoking our children to anger by neglecting them. But another way that we can provoke our children to anger is by being overbearing in our authority. Yes, of course, we do have a God-given authority in the lives of our kids, but how should we exercise that authority? A drill sergeant has authority over the soldiers under his command, but that's probably not a good model for us in the way that we exercise our authority. Jesus had authority over the disciples, and how did he exercise that authority? By teaching them, by training them, by loving them, by, by caring for them, by by providing gentle correction when they needed it, that's the model that we need to follow. Overbearing parents tend to provoke their children to anger because they're constantly criticizing their kids. Their kids begin to feel like they can never do anything right because mom or dad is always pointing out their failures, always pointing out, here's what you should have done better. Yes, we need to provide correction for our children, but it's important for us to think about the impact that our words have on the hearts and the minds of our kids. I read one book uh, by a pastor last year who said that for, for every word of criticism that he offers to his kids, he tries to provide five words of encouragement. I think that's a good idea, trying to have a five to one ratio. Okay, I need to correct you here. Let me encourage you now in, in, in five different ways. Our kids should know that we're pleased with them, that we're not just looking out to see what's, where, where's the next misstep that they're going to take, but that we're eager to encourage them and that we're slow to criticize. Also, I think that parents of adult children can sometimes provoke their kids to anger by treating them, by treating them as though they were still little kids. <laughs> when, your, when your children are grown, or if your children already are grown, remember that when you were their age, when you were 20 or, or 30 or, or however old they might be, you didn't want to be treated like a child anymore. <laughs> you wanted to be treated like an adult. And it's important for us to give the same respect to our adult children when they reach that stage of life. And so we need to avoid provoking our children to anger. That's what we need to not do in Ephesians 6.4. And instead, what should we do? We're called to bring up our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, there's a lot in that sentence. So I just want to think about some of the words that Paul uses here. First of all, the words of the Lord at the end of that sentence, are extremely important. Imagine for a moment if those words were missing from verse 4. For, from verse four. If Paul just wrote, bring them up with good discipline and instruction. You could take that to mean that you should care for the needs of your kids and teach them things like how to brush their teeth, how to dress themselves, how to ride a bike, how to drive a car. And of course, all those things are good, and, and we should teach our kids to do all of those things. But when Paul writes about raising our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, he's emphasizing that it's our responsibility as parents to teach our children about the Lord Jesus. It's interesting that the Bible never specifically says, and I'm going to sound like a heretic here for a minute, the Bible never specifically says that it's the church's job to teach children about Jesus. Did you know that? Now, of course, the church should teach everyone about, in the congregation about Jesus, whether they're two, or whether they're 92, or anywhere in between. That's why it's important for us to have things like Sunday school, and Awana, and Vacation Bible School, and so forth. But you can't find a verse in the Bible that says, Church, teach the kids about Jesus. Pastors, teach the kids about Jesus. Why not? 
because this is primarily the parent's responsibility. There are many verses in Scripture that say, parents, teach the Word of God to your children. Teach your kids to follow Christ. That's what Ephesians 6, 4 says. Fathers, bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You'll find many verses like this in the book of Proverbs. In fact, the whole book of Proverbs is teaching from a father to his son, telling him about how to follow the Lord. And so, every Christian parent, in a sense, is called to carry out the Great Commission in your home with your kids. You know the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Paul is basically saying here, parents, do that with your kids. Make disciples of them. Teach your kids to observe all that Jesus has commanded us. And of course, what's the most important thing of all that we can teach our kids? It's the gospel. It's the good news that the Son of God died as a sacrifice for sinners. That he rose from the dead on the third day. And that he offers everlasting life to everyone who will trust him as their Savior. You know, if our kids learn one thing from us, this is what it should be. They should hear over and over and over and over again, God loves you. God sent His Son Jesus to die, to save you from your sin. There's forgiveness in Christ. There's eternal life in Christ. There's nothing more important for you, son or daughter, than embracing Jesus as your Savior. We want our kids to know this. We want our kids to embrace Christ as their Savior. We do not want our kids to grow up to be good little Pharisees who are really well behaved, who do everything right because they're trusting in their own righteousness, their own good works to get them into heaven. We want our kids to know, I'm a sinner, but I have a great Savior. And Jesus Christ is a wonderful, gracious Savior. He died for me. He rose to give me life. We want our kids to hear day in and day out that the only way to live is by resting in Christ as their Savior. In fact, for all of us who are parents, there are times when we fail in our parenting, aren't there? <laughs> if we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we need to ask our kids to forgive us. And you know what? Those really are perfect times to show our kids, I need a Savior too. Dad is not perfect. Mom is not perfect. But Jesus is perfect. And Jesus is my hope. Now, all of that is why this little phrase, of the Lord, at the end of the verse, is really important. And so now let's ask the question, what exactly does Paul mean by talking about the, the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Well, this word discipline basically means training. In fact, Paul only uses this particular word one other time in all of his letters, and it's in 2 Timothy 3.16. That verse, you probably know it, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training, there's the word, for training in righteousness. And so we, if you put together those two verses, what does it tell us? It tells us that we need to use the Word of God to train our children in righteousness. Of course, that involves using the Bible to teach our kids what to avoid. Here's the sin that you need to avoid, kids. And how to walk in righteousness. How, how do you glorify Christ and walk with Him? And this word that Paul uses for, for discipline is also used a lot back in the book of Proverbs to describe the process of correction. When a child is disobedient or, or makes a foolish decision, a loving parent is going to use discipline to bring correction and help that child to get back into the circle of blessing. A wise and loving parent is going to say, it's dangerous out there when you leave the circle of blessing. There are consequences for sin. And so repent. Come back to where it's safe. And then, moving on to the word instruction. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. Instruction obviously involves teaching our kids. Helping them to grow in, the, in their knowledge of God, and their knowledge of His Word. But this word also involves admonishing our kids admonishing them to live out what they're taught. A wise parent will plead with their children at times. They'll plead with them and say, I, I don't want you to make foolish decisions. I love you. I, I want you to be wise. I want you to follow Christ. 
There are times when our children need not only information, they need to be warned. There are other times that they need to be encouraged. There are, there are times when they even need to be rewarded for doing what's right. Just like our Heavenly Father rewards us. And so, raising our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord really involves using every tool that's in the toolbox. Teaching, pleading with our kids, encouraging them, correcting them, disciplining them, instructing them, so that they can learn to live as disciples of Jesus. And I also need to point out that we can do all of this, and we can do it well, and at the end of the day, the truth is that only God can change it can change their hearts. That's why it's so important to pray for our children. And it's also why, let me, let me just say this to encourage you, it's also why you shouldn't beat yourself up if your kids are not walking with the Lord today. You cannot change the hearts of your children. You and I are not the Holy Spirit. But we can still pray for them. And it's amazing how God will often use the faithful prayers of parents as parents pray for the kids month after month year after year, sometimes even decade after decade, how God will use those faithful prayers to eventually bring those kids back to himself. Now, there's one more word in verse 4 that I want to point out. The first word in the verse is what? Fathers. Now, Paul is addressing fathers here. This does not mean that verse 4 doesn't apply to mothers too. Mothers obviously play a huge role in bringing up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I think that this is simply reflecting the fact, which we saw last Sunday, that the husband bears the responsibility of headship, uh, the responsibility of spiritual leadership in the family. And so all that is to say, brothers, we have a great responsibility here. We're not only called to lead our wives but to, and to help them to grow in the Lord, but we're also called to lead our children and to help our children to grow in the Lord. When men do this, and when they take the responsibility seriously, it can have an incredible effect on the entire family. And so as we close this morning, I just want to ask all of you that are parents to think about your children and to think about what they're going to be like 10 years from now, or maybe 15 years from now. What do you want them to be like? I hope that your greatest desire is that they would love Jesus with all of their heart, and that they would be following him faithfully. As parents, we not only have a great responsibility, but we also have a great opportunity to be instruments of God's grace in the lives of our kids. And so God would love to give you the grace to help your kids to become growing, maturing Christians as you take the opportunity he's given you to invest in the lives of your children. Let's pray together. Father, again, we're so thankful for the children that you've entrusted to us. And Father, I pray that you would help us to do everything that we possibly can to help our children to walk with Jesus. Lord, help us to carry out the Great Commission in our homes as we teach our children about you and about the good news that Jesus came to be their Savior. And, and Lord, we pray for our kids because at the end of the day, only you can change their hearts. We cannot do that ourselves. And so we pray for our kids that you would work in the heart of every child in this church and every teenager in this church so that all of them would know Jesus, they would follow Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. I pray for the, for the, um, for the adult children uh, that are represented here, um, for those who, who have kids that are grown, Lord, that you would work in their lives as well and to help them to follow Jesus faithfully. And so, Lord, would you encourage us as we seek to raise our kids for you. Would you give us little reminders day by day that you are with us, and we ask the Lord that you would work in the hearts of our kids and use us to be instruments of your grace in their lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.